is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Please have a seat. them to finally be able to do kids church again can you all hear me okay no i am on that's good well it's very good to have everybody here with us this morning so good to say see so many faces i haven't seen for quite a number of weeks church is a good thing to be in the house of the lord but if you're joining us online we welcome you as well because we love you you're connected with us and we want to say thank you for joining us today either on site online or on demand you can do it at another time if you can't join us. Welcome to you, though, everyone that's here. Welcome to everyone that's with us online. This morning, I want to let, let us know we're going to take up our offering, not for the Thanksgiving box for our local missions, but this one week we want to take this offering box and dedicate it to our overseas missions. See, this month we have not been able to do uh, our food table, and therefore we've not been raising any money for our missions program, so what we want to do is we want to give. In fact, I think it's a great thing to give. Give without expectation of receiving anything is, is the best way. And this is how we will feed our people over in Africa, the, the, the churches that we're connected with over there. It's how we will support our missionaries. So the Thanksgiving box, if you brought your, your beanies, your, your gloves, the scarves, whatever you might have had, just leave them down the front. That's fine too. We'll make sure that they go to the Thanksgiving box. But the Thanksgiving box today only, this week... Next week, back to Thanksgiving for the, for the people living on the streets. But this week only, we will be giving for our missions, our overseas missions. I've got, with that in mind, I do want us just to have a look at some interviews I did this week with a couple of our missionaries, including some who you may not know, a brand new missionary that we're supporting out of our church financially. We have been praying for them for quite a while. So maybe we can play those videos, and then we'll come back to our time of worship. Well, hello. Hello. Uh, I'd love to introduce to you a couple of our new missionaries. This is Rob and Katie Hovenden. Is that, Hi. have I said it right? Hovenden, yeah. Hovenden. That works. Yeah. We'll get it. So this is Rob and Katie Hovenden. And we've just undertaken to begin to support them, not just anymore in prayer, but also with our finances. And they've been doing a great work training people in mechanics and in flight school, I guess, over in, in America for being missionaries. And very soon they're set to go to... Papua New Guinea to the Weeback area. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to ask Rob and Katie a couple of questions and hopefully they can share a bit more information about this. And I want you to catch their heart. I want you to hear from them. I want you to know um, that they're serving God on our behalf and ways that we can actually help to support them. Now, I believe in missions. I believe we need to either pray, give, or go, or all three. And I'm grateful to God for anyone that does serve God on the mission field as our representatives, and we want to partner with them. So, Rob and Katie, thanks for being here. Yes. Cool. Hey, uh, can I get you to tell me a little bit about your family, first of all? Yeah, yeah sure. All right. Well, um, I would love to share about our family, since how I stay home with, with them <laughs> every day. So, we have um, four children now, and you guys may remember we were there last year, some of you may remember us, we have three um, older kids. So our son, John T is 13. We have an 11 year old daughter, Brielle, and a nine year old daughter, Miller. And just in December last year, we welcomed our fourth child, Archie, um, to the family. So Very he's cool. our little American citizen. <laughs> um, yeah, so I homeschool the kids. Well, at the moment we're on summer break, but um, yeah, Rob is working full time at, at SMAP here. And yeah. That's very cool. Now. I just said before, you're about to move over to Papua New Guinea. Can you tell us when is that going to happen and who are you going to be working with? Yeah. Yeah, so we're, um, we've taken on a position with an organisation, a little mission group called Samaritan Aviation. Um, they operate float planes in Weewak and PNG on the north, um, north coast. Um, the main, main reason they're there, the, um, the Sepik River, it's like 700 kilometres long and there's nearly, uh, was it 400,000 people living along it? Um, there's no other mission organizations running float planes there at the moment. Um, so, you know, the float planes are really just um, 
what's giving them access into the community to be able to do uh, ministry and to serve, uh, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in that place. So we're um, a rough time frame at the moment. So I've my commitment here at the School of Mission Aviation Technology is until um, my visa is good till um, April next year. So we're thinking in about March, we'll probably finish up here. Um, we'll come back to Australia and then uh, we'll be working on partnership development before uh, God willing, we'd love to be in PNG by mid year. By this time next year, we're, yeah. we're praying for, but you know, with the way the world is at the moment, we know that, you know, plans made are not always um, carried yeah. out. So yeah, we're just trusting God that yeah. we'll be able to get there and, his timing and we'll see what happens cool and you'll make sure that you do come back and, and visit with us as well when you're here won't you we, we will yes i Good. have family in bernie yeah so that's yeah. right yeah tell us a bit about your family because we were just talking about that tell me yeah. about, about your mum and dad yeah my mum and dad they actually just live around the corner in collins street and um they um and they're not church goers generally so you probably i don't know some of you i'm sure know them they've been around bernie for a long time but uh yeah, a great, great couple. And I have a younger sister, Naomi, as well. She lives in Melbourne. Um, yeah. But yeah. And so she's, uh, we discussed, she's doing okay with the COVID crisis at the moment. Yeah, she is. Yeah. She's just, um, she's just found a new place to live and she's looking for a job. She's just, she was traveling overseas when all the COVID stuff hit. So she's um, trying to find her feet back in Melbourne again. But yeah, interesting yeah. time to be doing that. So oh, that's very good. <laughs> Well, we are really looking forward to having you join us um, as representatives of us. And anyone out there that is watching, Rob and Katie and their whole family join us every Saturday night, their time, Sunday morning, our time for church. And so it's been fantastic to have our missionaries and our representatives joining with us. I said before, we've just taken on the financial support of Rob and Katie. They were sent from Acton Chapel. And what a great, great couple they are. Rob came from New South Wales originally, uh, but we'll forgive him for that. <laughs> yeah. you, can't, you can't have everything now, can you? Yeah. At least he married up. He moved. He married a, a Tasmanian. So That's right. He's yeah. half Tasmanian now. So. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and the kids are all Tasmanian. <laughs> well, no, it's yeah. very, very, very good to have them. And I, wanna, I just want to say thank you for serving Jesus on our behalf. We are praying for you. We are giving to help support you. And we look forward to coming to visit you on the field as well. So we'll be amazing. maybe next year, maybe the year after, we'll see yeah. as it works out. God bless you guys. I'll sign off here. So if you want to just say goodbye or hello, oh. and tell your family that you're online and they can watch you give a talk if they want. Yeah, yeah, will do. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's nice to see you all, even though we can't really see you, but you can see us. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to catching up with you all next year, hopefully, Lord willing. Um, yeah. Thanks. God bless. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye. All right. Okay. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the the work? Just show us some of those planes you were just showing me. That was fantastic. Sure. Yeah. Just in our flight planning room here at the moment. But so I'll just quickly show you. Here is the flight training hangar um, where we where I spend most of my day. Um, so we've got a two hundred six here that belongs to the Mission Aviation Fellowship. So that was cool when we came here, and it uh, it was a familiar plane to work on. Other than that, we've got. Um, a few little 172s here we use for primary flight training. And then this one here in the middle is owned by Wycliffe Bible Translators. Um, and then other than that, um, you can see all the flags up here on the roof. So they're all countries that uh, students have either come from or gone to in, uh, in missions. So wow. it's hard to see, but then uh, there's this Australia and PNG uh, front and center up in the middle of the hangar there. So. Very nice. Hey, thanks for sharing that. And um, no worries. We are, we are looking forward to seeing you again. Fantastic. Hey, thank you all and uh, God bless. Well, cheers.
Good everyone in church. As I mentioned before, it's so good to have you here. If you're joining us online, it is great to have you joining with us as well. We are very grateful. Now, for those of you here online that got to see one of our videos of, of one of our missionaries, we'll show them after the service as well so that you can hopefully hear from the new, new missionaries, the Hovenden family. I'll get it right one day. You see the Hovenden or Hovenden? Hovenden, sorry. They're watching us right now online, by the way. They've been joining us all the way on the mission field with us every week during the coronavirus. So we, we love having you with us. So thank you for joining us as well. Thank you, Carmen, for leading the worship. Thank you, team, for being part of it this morning. So glad you could be there. Everyone that could be with us this morning, it's great to have you in the house of God. Well, I don't know about you, but in my life, I have many times tried to plant some seeds to grow crops. Anyone else had that kind of experience where you try to plant seeds and get veggies or fruit to grow? Trouble is, I'm not very successful at it. Anyone out there like that? I need advice for someone like from like, someone like Bruce French, but since getting married, Natasha and I, we've tried to um, plant veggie patches in every place we've lived, pretty much, especially when we own the house, and I don't think we've had, ever had a really decent crop of anything. I, I don't know what, maybe broad beans, but who wants to eat them anyway? <laughs> That's probably a lie, by the way. I don't think we even got them. <laughs> you know, our, our strawberry patches, they fail. I thought they were unkillable, but anyway, they fail. We, we just don't have any green thumbs in our family. I don't know what it is. Now, uh, when we moved here, we had a, a nice tomato tree in our backyard, tomato bush, and it was pretty good. It was starting to look like we were going to get fruit from it, the, the tomatoes. And just when you thought you were about to be able to have a harvest, the wallabies came in and ate them all. So if you're watching from another country and you don't have wallabies, we have a few people that join us from America, they're, they're like a miniature kangaroo. And they get in there everywhere right around here. So they've eaten all our tomatoes and all, also the tomato plant. There's no more tomato plants, so we're not going to get any tomatoes growing. In Queensland, things would die because of our um, the hot sun up there. Not so hot down here at, at this time of year. But up in Queensland, it's still hot, and everything would just get baked but, you know, other times I'd get cured because we'd have pests come and eat them and all kinds of things. So we just never had any luck. But when I was a kid, with my father, he must have had a bit more of a green thumb than I do because we could actually grow veggies back then. Uh, I don't think it's got anything to do with the kind of veggie seed or, or anything. It was probably my father's skill. Now, we would plant corn and we'd get a, a, a crop of corn, which is great. We'd plant beans and, and peas and all kinds of things. It was fantastic growing up eating these veggies. I even remember once with my brother, we got our apple and we got the seeds out and we planted the apple seeds and after about two years we had an apple tree growing. Like it must have grown slow but there's a slow process but I never got to see any of the fruit from that tree but even apple seeds would grow at that stage and I don't know but I would have enjoyed eating the apple because all the seeds that we grew. Have you ever heard that saying, you can count the amount of seeds in an apple, but you can't count the number of apples in a seed? I want you to keep that in mind today when I preach to you about what I'm going to talk about. Because today I want us to look at the kingdom of God, as Jesus says, it is likened to this. Jesus said, what shall I liken the kingdom of God? And he said, well, I'll liken it to a seed that was sown. So we're going to look at that in just a moment. I want to let you know this, the kingdom of heaven is not getting to heaven when we die. The kingdom of God is not where we go at the end of our life. The kingdom of God is what we bring to establish, it, well sorry, it will partly be that, but it starts in the here and the now, in our lives. We let heaven come in our life and through our lives into the lives of others. So God's kingdom is where God rules, is that right? Where he reigns, that's the kingdom of God. If he is king in my life, then his kingdom is established in this place. So when we pray the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are talking about, Lord, I'm going to submit to you and let you be king in my life. That's what the kingdom of God starts looking like. So Jesus said, what is the kingdom of, light, of heaven like? Well, it's a place where people get set free. It's a place where people get healed. It's a place where people get saved. It's a place where people come and find community and connection with other people. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the fact that a lady was set free from being a bondage, in bondage to Satan with her healing. 
And healing is one of the ways that the kingdom of God comes. But let's look today at Luke's gospel in the next passage after that one for Luke 13, verse 18 and then through to 30. Verse 18 says this, He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard, a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in the garden. And it grew and it became a tree and the birds of the air made nests and it, and in its branches. And again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Let me say this for you. Uh, we are going to be looking today at mustard, bread, for the road. So if you want the title for the sermon, that's what it is. It's, uh, maybe it's a mustard sandwich that you take on, on a road trip. M- mustard and bread for the road. So there's an Australian scholar called uh, Ian Andrew Menzies. I think, you, Jeff, do you know Andrew Menzies? Church of Christ guy. A great guy. Re- reading a book of his at the moment. I'm reading so many books, it's not funny. But this one I've got through a couple of chapters. I'll get through it in the end. Andrew Menzies' book called Kingdom Communities. And he writes this about the mustard seed. He said, we know that a mustard seed is tiny. But in this parable, we see that when it is planted, it becomes a big tree. Not just any tree, a mighty garden tree in which the birds can perch. We think we get it. It's not really about the seed, but the tree it becomes. That makes sense, doesn't it? Our cultural imagination encourages visions of a big, powerful tree, maybe like a big eucalyptus or something, a big oak tree if you're in America. That sort of seems, that sort of imagery seems suitable, but it's not the biblical imagery that we are expected to see because a mustard tree does not look like a mighty oak or a mighty eucalyptus tree. It is actually a little, a a fairly big shrub. In fact, it's not technically even called a tree. Am I correct, Bruce? Because did you go and do the homework after we talked about this? No. But anyway, that's what I'm told. So if it's not me, we're going to blame Andrew Menzies. Uh, I'm reading his research. So if you're reading this parable... We might actually be reading it incorrectly if we think and we imagine that really big tree. So, what about this? Jesus actually meant it when he said that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Now, is the mustard seed the smallest of all seeds? In Jesus' day, that was the smallest he knew about. But I think we might be able to find some smaller ones. Maybe a poppy seed is a little bit smaller. But either way, it doesn't matter. The point is that something little grows into something big. That makes sense. So the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, and he meant it when he said it, because he said that like that, a seed that grows to a large garden tree. But the mustard seed, as I mentioned, is not the smallest of all seeds, and the tree, believe it or not, is not the biggest of all trees. So what did Jesus mean? Well, actually, the mustard tree is really called a shrub. It's a very, very big shrub. But mustard shrubs only grow at most to five metres high, no bigger. Uh, If you're in America, five metres would be 15 feet. So just in case you're watching online. But in the garden, they provide wonderful perches for birds that they can stand out and and perch in as they watch over all the fruit that's growing so that they can go and eat all your seed, eat your harvest. Vegetables and herbs, they'll perch over all them and find themselves a nice feed. We have to let go of the imagery of the mighty tree in order to understand Jesus' kingdom parable. Actually, the kingdom of God is like that hardy, scraggy shrub. It doesn't look very pretty, does it? It's not a pretty tree. Well, the fruit looks pretty. But what this tree can do is it can pervade and it can overtake. It, it It will dominate wherever it's planted. It's a bit like the blackberries. Anyone here ever planted blackberries? You don't need to, do you? They just grow on their own. You find them anywhere. Like I see them down on the foreshore down here. They're in Canberra. They're in Queensland. They just handle any, any temperature, any climate, and they just grow. Maybe that's what we should have grown, Natasha. That's what we should have. Not strawberries. Blackberries. Just as what well, we didn't, there'd be no backyard. So there's another thing about the mustard tree. It's not just hardy, and, but a healthy mustard shrub will produce up to 8,000 seeds. Did you hear that? 8,000 seeds. You can count how many seeds in an apple, but you can't count how many 
So you you can't count how many apples are in a seed. 8,000 seeds per crop of of a mustard tree. They reproduce other mustard shrubs exceedingly well. If you left a mustard shrub alone in your yard for a few years, you might come back and find your whole backyard dominated. Just totally overgrown, taken over by these. And what's more, the birds that have actually nested in the tree will have eaten some of the seed and they'll have scattered those seeds wherever they fly and the mustard seed begins to pervade not just the own backyard but other environments wherever they get to. Do you hear this? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that when it's planted, grows into being the mustard tree. A second idea was also that of the the, uh, yeast in in the, or the yeast or the leaven in the bread. You you put that little bit of leaven and it overtakes, it begins to permeate. And that is what God wants his kingdom to be like in our lives. He wants his kingdom to come in us and through us and begin to permeate. So that wherever we go, we take his kingdom with us. The kingdom of God, like a mustard tree, you see, planted, grows the mustard shrub and grows and spreads and will turn up in the most unexpected places. This is how God wants his kingdom to be. One that is very hardy, very durable. One that takes the message to unlikely places and will just begin to see it expand and spread. How good is that? If you're online the mustard seed beginning to spread. And maybe through your life it can spread to others as well. You could take this and share this message today and and maybe it will get out to a few others. And I'd encourage any of you that share this. Last weekend, I don't know how or why, but more than 800 people got to see this message, on the last week's message online because some, some people began to share it. Friend, Jesus wants us to bear much fruit. I mentioned that two weeks ago. He was disappointed. He was Frustrated, he was heartbroken when he came to a tree. It was a, was a, uh, I can't remember what, wasn't, what tree it was. He came to the, the tree and there was no fruit on the tree, the fig tree. So he said, oh, that's it, cut it down, get rid of it. Told you, we do not want to be a waste of space when it comes to Jesus. We don't want it. He wants us to bear fruit. As your pastor, I want you to bear fruit. It would be great for you guys to be fruitful. Now, I don't mean you all have to go have babies. Although, anyone that wants to, we're finished, myself, Natasha and I. But anyone else, do you feel free, encouraged, people getting married, that's okay. But that's not really the fruit we're talking about. We're talking about the eternal fruit, the fruit which is others coming to know Jesus. Can I tell you what? I want to bear fruit. So Jesus wants us to bear fruit. I want you to bear fruit, and I want me to bear fruit. I want to be a, live a fruitful life, one that is glorifying to God, one that where God says, thank you, one, one that pleases him, one that glorifies and honours him. I personally desire to bear much fruit, not just a little fruit. But one thing I cannot bear, and I want to tell you this as honestly as I can, one thing I cannot bear is the idea of Satan having a bigger kingdom than God. That idea, it, it, it frustrates me, it breaks my heart to even consider that might be possible. But right now, currently in Australia, maybe at best 7% of our population are church-going, practising Christians. Now, I know coronavirus has possibly made that a little bit harder, but I want to tell you this. You can be going to church online as long as you're part of a community. The Bible does not know any form of Christianity that exists outside of community. So we need to be part of other Christians, that community. But, and it can happen online. It can happen in, in situ. It can happen in house groups. It can happen in small groups. But it must happen. Otherwise, it's not authentic Christianity as the Bible knows it. I'm devastated at the thought that Satan's kingdom currently is bigger than God's in our country. And so I think it needs to be all of our commitment that that hell must not be bigger than heaven. That Satan must not be able to mock the Lord of all glory by saying, look, I've got a bigger kingdom than yours. I think we need to take that personally. I think we need to do something about it because Jesus' kingdom, he's our king. And we want to see his reign established in the lives of many others. But that's not done by force. It's done by sharing the gospel and letting his word get out. 
So here's some good news from, the, from this text. The intended meaning of the power is God's kingdom grows from small to large. How good is that? So even at 7%, it can grow. It can be, get bigger. It can begin to pervade. Small things begin to pervade. And then they provide protection and provision to those who dwell in them. All the people of the earth. So this is wonderful news. This gospel of the kingdom is Jesus' kingdom. Prisoners get released. Just like we saw a couple of weeks ago in that message. It's a life-giving kingdom. One that gives life both now and throughout all of eternity. So why wouldn't we want to share it with others? Why wouldn't we want other people to be rescued from a hell and a Christless eternity? It is eternal life that starts in our present life, but one that ends up with us having a relationship that starts now, carrying on for all of eternity. God's kingdom is not a bunch of rule keeping. Hello? You don't get to be part of God's kingdom by keeping a bunch of rules. It's not a matter of being miserable or defeatist either. Let's just hold the fort until Jesus comes. That's not the way God wants us to look at it. That's not the mentality he wants. His kingdom is meant to pervade. It's meant to overtake. It's meant to to spread. His kingdom, by the way, is one of righteousness. It's one of peace and of joy. That's what the scripture says. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Here's some other things that the kingdom of God is. The book of Corinthians says that in God's kingdom, these three three things will remain forever, faith, love, and hope. These are, are good things, aren't they? Righteousness, peace, joy, faith, love, hope. Oh, these are good things. Why wouldn't we want to share that with others? All these start in the now and continue throughout all of eternity. The kingdom of God is not where we go to escape this world or where we go to get away from Satan. The kingdom of God is one where the kingdom comes and is established in our lives as we live that will last throughout all eternity when this life is over. So who gets to be part of the kingdom? Can anyone join? Well, yes, anyone can join. Who will, whoever will respond to the gospel call, whether they're listening online, whether in the house, whether it's when you talk to them down, at your, down the street or in your, in your, uh, over coffee somewhere in a coffee shop, anyone who will, will respond to the invitation can be saved. The Bible says, whoever, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's not just an elect few. It's not just a, a holy huddle. It is anybody that will respond to Jesus can be saved. I know, some of you are thinking, but didn't Jesus say that it's hard to get to heaven? Anyone heard that? Anyone thinking that thought right now? It's okay if you're thinking that, because that's where the story goes right now. Let's go on with the passage for today, because the narrow door is what we're going to talk about. He went on his way through towns and villages. This is continuing with Luke's gospel, immediately following about the seed. Through the towns and the villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, who, will, who are those who be saved and are they few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not, not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shuts the door and you begin to stand outside and knock and the door, at the door and say, Lord, open to us. And he will answer, I do not know you, You, and I do not know where you come from. Then he will begin to say, we ate, you'll begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught us in the street. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Depart from me, you workers of evil, workers of iniquity. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets of the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and north and south and recline at the table of the kingdom of God. That's us. We're part of the, we're part of the south, aren't we? We're part of the east or the west. Wherever Israel was, we're way away from it. And behold, some who are last will be first and some who are first will be last. Let me ask you this question. Is it hard to get to heaven? The answer to that question is both yes and no. (laughs) You don't have to do anything except receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. So that part is real easy. 
But the fact is, it's, it's difficult because it's exclusive. You can't do it on your own, and you can't do it through another religion. You only do it through Jesus. So is the gate narrow? Absolutely. Jesus and Jesus alone. John 14 verse 6 says that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father unless they come through me. So there's one way and one way only. If you like, Acts will tell you it like this. He says, there's no other name given under, under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There's one, one, one way and no other way. It is Jesus. So try as hard as we might by being good enough or by find, trying to find our way through another religion, we will never find our way to eternal life. Whatever we do is not going to be good enough unless we ask Jesus to do it for us. You know what? You could even come to a Christian church week in, week out, and still miss out. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? Because it comes through Jesus. So while Jesus declares that he is the only way, he also opens up the way for all who will respond to him. How good is that? Yes, it's a narrow way, and yes, it might be difficult to find. You can't find any other way, but through Jesus, if you'll call upon him. The Bible says, as many as call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is great news. Jesus is inclusive, and he is exclusive. He'll include all of you. He'll draw you all in, but he is the only way. Friend, if you're listening online, you've never heard that before. Why don't you call on Jesus? Don't, don't keep trying to do it your own way. Why don't you call on Jesus? Because he's the only way. It's seemingly paradoxical. That's the nature of the gospel. One way it seems like this way up seems down, down seems up. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So in order to access and enjoy abundant life, the abundant life that Jesus gives, we need to give ourselves to Jesus and respond by taking him. At the end of the today's service, we'll have that opportunity to pray that prayer, both for people here on site and people online. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. In one sense... Saying, I want us to be like roadblocks, stop signs, warning signs. I want us to be that kind of person that when we're out on the street, people say, we might say there's a wide way that's heading to destruction. So stop, you're heading to destruction. I want you and me to live our lives in a way that is a warning to others. Don't go that way because that way is destruction. Jesus is the narrow gate and we are called to live as followers of the great God and, of our great God and King. We have a job to help others see that there is only one way to be free from Satan and only one way to have eternal life. This life is in Christ alone. Jesus said this, and it's a scary, scary statement. I don't ever want to hear him say this to me. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. This line of Jesus makes me tremble. Not only for myself, but for the countless multitude who currently do not know Christ. I, I, I don't like going to sleep at night thinking that my neighbours are living without Christ. Knowing Jesus is the only surefire way to escape the fire. Being a friend of Jesus is the most important thing that each and every one of us could ever do in our life. And the next thing is, what are we doing to help others become Jesus' friends? I've got the next title here, Sheep Tracks and Highways. Have you ever seen a sheep track? If you're an Aussie living in a sheep growing area, a sheep growing, a sheep area, we don't grow sheep, they grow, but... Yeah. Just plant a few and they'll grow. Uh, not true. Uh, if you're, if you're watching online and you don't have sheep and you don't experience that, maybe you're in a city where they don't have that kind of thing. In Australia, we have these open spaces and, and sheep are an animal that will follow others. They'll follow the track and, and as they walk a path, they all walk the same path and they begin to wear a path into 
what might be an overgrown field, but there'll be a sheep track that almost will never grow back because they keep walking it. I had that picture in my mind when it says that there's this narrow path. But here's the thing I know about a sheep track, is the more sheep that walk on it, the more defined it becomes. The easier it is to find. So for you and I, as we begin to follow Christ, it might have been a little bit difficult when we first became a Christian. But the more you and I follow Christ, the easier it gets for those who are coming behind us. So when I follow Jesus, I, it might mean that my family now know how to follow Christ. When I follow Jesus, it means my neighbours or my workmates, my colleagues can begin to see what it is like to live for Jesus. And I begin to make that sheep track more and more defined. How incredible when that sheep track becomes a broad and wide highway. So when Jesus said that wide is the way that leads to destruction... I think we can see that was a statement of how it was then, but it's not Christ's intention right now. Currently, at this time in, in the Africa and in China and in Iran and other places, countless millions are turning to Christ every year. And that is great news. It gets easier and easier to find your way once someone else does it. So for you and I, if, the more we follow Jesus, the more likely someone else is to follow Christ as well. So I think that comment might be a statement of the current situation rather than Jesus' intention. Jesus does not intend the pathway to life to be so difficult to find. He wants us to show it to others. So rather than being just a, a stoplight or a warning sign, now we need to be a, a way that actually indicates the direction. According to... Let me ask you this. Do you think that Jesus intends his kingdom to remain small? Do you? You don't have to answer that to me. But do you think that was the case? That might have been how it started, but is that what he intends? According to your faith, the Bible says, so let it be done unto you. If we think that when we talk to someone about Christ, they will never listen to us, they'll probably never listen to us. But if we have an expectation that this message will actually change someone's life, We'll, con we'll converse with them, we'll, we'll actually talk about it in such a way that's attractive and we'll actually draw them towards Christ. Our faith has a big part to play when it comes to winning people for Jesus. So when sharing our faith with our family, our friends or our colleagues, or even if you are brave enough with a stranger, I want you to believe that God can and will work with you because you're actually working with God to do his work, which is to spread his kingdom. Do we live it in such a way that others might want to follow? Is our example leading the way? I think the bright lights of Broadway might be a good way to think of this picture. When a road is well defined and well travelled, what they end up doing is they put street lights on that street, don't they? In some sense, we become the one that help people to find that way to life. You and I, as we live for Christ, we help others to see it. So when John the Baptist wrote, uh, began to tell his ministry, he would start with this saying, make straight the paths of God. Isaiah 40 verse 3 said, a voice calling of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised and every mountain and hill made low and the rough ground shall become level and the rugged place a plain. Let me give you this picture. I'm 47, just a couple of weeks ago now. When I was young, back in last millennium, it was. Okay, last century, both. When I was growing up, I lived in Canberra. And it was very common for us to travel up to Sydney for a holiday. It's probably a bit like going from here down to Hobart. I think you probably get that picture for yourselves in Tasmania that way. When, I wanted, when my parents wanted to take us on a family holiday to Sydney, it would take us six hours to get from the north of Canberra to the south of Sydney. And yes, we're heading the same direction, like that from, north to south, from south to north. We're heading that way. Six hours. Every, every track, every road, every wind, every bend, every town would stop, would go through. It just slowed you down. Probably like coming along the west coast here. It used to be that way too. And bit by bit, during the 1980s, they began to bypass all the towns. 
they began to put dual, way, dual carriageway through both ways, so two lanes, both north and south. First year, six, year, six hours turned to five, then five hours to four, then four to three and a half. And by the time I was old enough to drive myself, not because I drove super fast, and yeah, that might be true too, it would take me three hours door to door. A six-hour trip now took three hours door to door from the north of Canberra to the south of Sydney. What they did when they did this is they bypassed towns, they cut through hills, they they lifted up areas that were valleys, they put they built up the roads, and so the roads became plain and easy to travel, and you could travel at much safer speeds because you weren't doing corners. They widened out the roads. I think of that picture when I think of that text. Of, that, of those verses. Make straight the path of the Lord. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill be made low. Make a straight in the desert highway for our God. Do we attract others to Jesus? Do we make other people want to follow the way to life? Do we make it easier for someone to find their way to, Jesus, to heaven, to find their way to eternal life by the way we live? Are we making it easier because we represent Jesus well? Are we one of those bright lights on the side of the highway that says, this is the way? Maybe today while I've been preaching, maybe online today while I've been preaching, you've realised that you don't actually know God. And if asked... You'd have to be honest with yourself and say, you don't even know if when you die you go to heaven. Can I tell you this? Jesus says that you can know in this life, that you can know here and now by having a relationship with him. So if you get worried of when Jesus would say, depart from me, I never knew you, start knowing him now. So he'll never say to you, I never knew you. He'll say, welcome home. Welcome back. I've been waiting for you. not how much you know, but it is who you know that gets you into heaven. Heaven is the ultimate who you know. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. You don't need to wait for tomorrow. You don't need to wait for next week or next year. So as I close this morning, I want to pray a prayer and I want to ask people to join us. We're going to pray a prayer asking Jesus to forgive us for our sin. We're going to pray this prayer choosing to follow Christ, and in so doing, making it easy for others to follow Christ also. If you're online, why don't you pray this prayer? It'll be up on our screen behind me. Dear Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I have done many things that don't please you. I've lived my life for myself and I'm sorry. And I now repent and I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross to save me. You did for me what I could not do for myself. And so I come to you now and I surrender control of my life to you from this day forward. Help me to live every day in a way that pleases you. I love you, Lord. And I thank you that I will spend eternity with you. Amen. Now, if you pray that prayer here or online, I want you to reach out and tell someone because part of being saved is actually telling others about Jesus. I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Jesus. My favourite name for Christians is this. It was the one used in the book of Acts. Followers of the way. I love that title of our church, On the Journey, because we're following the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. I love to ask our singers, musicians to come and at the end of our time, we'll put the, the thing up for the missionaries. We have coffee today. If you're here for the first time, free coffee. If you haven't had a free coffee yet, Steve, hang out and have a free cup of coffee. We've got one for you. God bless you. Online, I can't get you one, but you can get one for yourself. And I won't make you pay for it. God bless you.